right, here we go. All right, so we've got that and that. that. Ooh, whoops, I don't know if I meant to do that. <clears throat> All right, so we were we were talking about the parables, and we were going through them and just making observations and seeing seeing what we could see and applying the lens of uh, already or not yet. <clears throat> so when Jesus talks about the kingdom of heaven, he typically uses parables to describe the kingdom of heaven. And a few weeks ago, we read through an article that uh, described the kingdom as already but not yet. So it's present. But there's also another sense in which it is its future. It hasn't come yet, hasn't come in its fullness yet. And so when Jesus uses parables uh, to teach, he's using a little story, uh, a metaphor, a simile to describe something about the kingdom that we should, uh, we should think about. Now, the, the purpose, part of the purpose of the parables is to get you thinking. Like it's not a it's not a straight up just doctrinal statement. This is what you need to know. It's a story. It's something that you're supposed to chew on. You're supposed to think about. You're supposed to. Uh, hmm. I wonder. I wonder what he meant by that. You're supposed to do that. Um, he's a <clears throat> he's an itinerant preacher and teacher, and he he tells these parables. Um, it could also be translated as like riddle, is kind of the idea. And for depending on the audience, uh, understanding was expected or not expected. There's uh, like he, he tells his disciples, these things have been given unto you and you already understand certain things. And with that understanding, more understanding will come. We talked about this last week. But for those that have hard hearts and don't, don't want to understand, or they reject what Jesus is preaching, then even what they do understand will be taken away from them. And so that's like the seed that falls on the wayside, and the birds come and pluck it up. <clears throat> so he's telling these parables, and for some it'll enlighten, and for some it's a judgment. It's because you have eyes that see but don't see, and you have ears but you don't hear, you have hearts that are hard so they don't understand, I'm only going to speak to, to you in parables, so that way you won't understand. Because remember, as he's, <clears throat> we're in like Matthew 13, and then the next, the next few parables are in Matthew 18. <laughs> Matthew 18. So much Matthew 18. Um, and then, in, yeah, and then 21. So I have, yeah, I have the, like, the list of the parables up there. They're found in the Synoptic Gospels. <clears throat> so, you know, he, he tells these parables, and like, once you get to Matthew 18, he's like maybe a month or two away from his death. And you get to Matthew 21 and 22 and then it's like 25. Like, we're talking within days of, of his crucifixion. We're getting really close to the end. So he's had three years of preaching and teaching. Or the people that he, is, he has preached to, they've had three years to hear it. And if they're rejecting it even then, that's when he goes, okay, fine, parables for you. And for some, that's a judgment. And for some, it's enlightening. And it helps them understand. Uh, we left off on uh, the wheat and the tares. Servants. Uh, let's see. Yeah, we were talking about the wheat and the tares. So in that one... <clears throat> Farmer goes out, sows the wheat, he goes to sleep, enemy comes in, sows tares among the wheat. Uh, the, his servants go, oh no, there's tares among the wheat. What should we do? And he goes, should we tear up the, the weeds to try and make sure that the wheat has, you know, has enough? And he goes, no, let them grow up together. And then when it comes harvest time, that's when we'll be able to, to distinguish between the two. And we'll bundle up the tares, throw them into the fire, and then we'll keep the wheat. Um, and so we talked about, I mean, he's using a farming analogy. These, these are farming people. They would understand what that, what that looks like. The wheat, once it, uh, once the, the kernels actually, uh, the fruit is born on the wheat, it gets heavy and it falls over. And so you'd be, you'd be able to tell the difference between 
a wheat and a tear because the wheat has fruit and it and it falls over it's heavy whereas the tear the the weeds they don't they don't actually bear any fruit they don't have anything there so they just keep standing up as a wheat does so then strike it with the sickle and then you go to the threshing floor and the heads of the wheat would just throw into the air. It's like chaff, it blows away. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever seen threshing before. Um, it's pretty cool. You, you basically like, you crunch under a big sled with an ox, all of the wheat that you've cut down and that separate, like it breaks open the, the kernel of the wheat and then you get the, the actual part that you can grind <clears throat> and make into flour. And then like you gather all of that up once it's all uh, broken apart and you have this like you can have either a fork or like a like a basket lid kind of thing and it's like you scoop it up and you get into a windy place and you just throw it up into the air and the wind separates all of the the kernel like the actual kernel and the casing that was around it and so the casing is super light and it flies away that's the chaff and it goes further down than the actual stuff that you want it goes closer to you. So it like makes two piles. You just like keep throwing it up in the air and it separates. And it's like, cool, now you've got all of your grain, bring it to the mill, they grind it with the millstone, now you have flour, and then you can make your bread. And then the little red chicken didn't have any help. Or little red hen, yeah, that's right. Yeah, little red hen didn't get any help, but everybody wanted that bread once it was done, it smelled real good. It's a lot of work, right? <clears throat> so he's using these farming analogies to describe what the kingdom of heaven is like. And with, <clears throat> with, um, with this one, well, it's, it's in the next part. All right, let's, let's read this one and then look at it through, ask questions about uh, already or not yet. So another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field which indeed is the least of all the seeds. But when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs and becometh a tree so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. All right, so what would be the point of that little story? So first, say again. Let your faith grow. Let your faith grow, okay? So the kingdom of heaven is like something. So this is a simile. So it's like a, a less direct compare or yeah, a less direct comparison. So if you use like or as, it's less direct. If you use a metaphor, so I could say clouds are like whipped cream. Or I could say clouds are whipped cream. And you would go, clouds are not whipped cream. <laughs> but but then it's like, well what's the comparison I'm making? If it's a metaphor, then it's a very direct comparison. There's something about clouds and something about whipped cream that overlap and the comparison makes sense. So it's like fluffy. Maybe that's the comparison. So if I was using more poetical language, I would use maybe a metaphor where it's more direct. A li like or as a simile is a little bit less direct. So it gives us information, but it's not as direct. Um, it's, not as, uh, it's not as poetic. Um, but yes, it's a grain of mustard seed. And then it even tells us that it's the least of all the seeds, right? So it's small. It's very, very small. But when it's sown in the ground and it grows, it becomes the greatest among the herbs. It becomes a tree. And it's like this giant kind of bush type thing. It's so big that even the birds of the air can come and lodge in the branches thereof. Okay, but in the previous parable, uh, the seed is the word. It's not faith. So are we are we talking about the same thing in this one necessarily? Hmm. Maybe. Yes, sir. Could it also maybe mean that it's like us, that we're small, but if our faith grows, other people will come to us? Hmm. 
Yeah. I mean, I think the overall thrust of this little one is that <clears throat> uh, the kingdom of God grows. So remember, we're, this is a comparison of the kingdom of heaven to uh, a seed that grows into a giant plant. So at the very least, we're talking about growth. There is growth. Now, if, if so we're going in the direction of like a person's faith, like you guys are emphasizing an individual faith, right? Which that makes sense within the kingdom of heaven, right? The kingdom of heaven is made up of individuals who have faith. If they don't have faith, then they in the kingdom, like what's going on here? But it should be growing. I guess one thing that I would, uh, uh, hmm. there's a difference between an is and an ought. So this is describing something like a reality that is. And uh, we should be careful to, we should be careful on our oughts. So is this saying that we should do anything? No, it's, it's just describing what the kingdom of heaven is like. The kingdom of heaven will, is, is, gro is a growing thing. It grows. It grows. Um, now, in, since, it came, since it came after this wheat and tares one, it's like, okay. That would be, would that be similar to when the master says, we'll just let it grow together? He tells the servants, no, 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 don't, don't, uh, don't, you know, go pull up the weeds because you might pull up the, the good stuff as well. Leave it until the end. The judgment happens at the end, whether it's uh, wheat or tares. And then this one talks about it's growing. But in that growth, there's a benefit to things that are not itself. So I do see your, like, where you're going with, uh, like, I can't, like, if the seed grows into a tree and the trees can house birds, the birds of the air can come and lodge in the branches thereof. Like, if the tree wasn't there, then the birds couldn't come, right? So there's a benefit to things that are outside of itself. Would that still be true of the kingdom of heaven? As it's growing, it can have influence on something that's outside of itself? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. We are the salt of the earth. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah, we are the mustard tree of the earth. <laughs> the greatest of, uh, of all the, the herbs, right? Yeah. Ooh, this one's short. Another parable spake he unto them. The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of mill till the whole was leavened. Like, that one's super short. But the kingdom of heaven is like yeast. So what's the, what's, the, what's the main point of likening the kingdom of heaven to yeast? It grows. Got any sourdough bakers in the house? I seem to remember we pass out a bunch of bread after, <laughs> after uh, VBS, right? You just, all you, it's, it's water and flour. Right? And the yeast is already either in the air or already like in the flour a little bit. And as long as you keep the ratios right and it's warm enough, it just grows. The yeast starts to eat, uh, starts to eat the, <clears throat> I guess eat the flour, essentially, right? And it breaks it down a little bit and you get a little bit of, uh, well, you get a lot of gas, right? The, the byproduct of, of yeast doing its thing is CO2. And then, like, a ti the tiniest bit of alcohol that's more vinegary than alcohol -y. And, like, that's the fermentation process. It just, but it grows. It grows. And you can, you can have a starter grow and then, like, use a little bit, make some bread. And this, you just add a little bit of flour, maybe a little bit of water, and it just keeps growing. And it, it'll just keep going. As long as you feed it, it's fine. You can make as much bread as, as you need to. They didn't have fast-acting 
yeast packets where you just dump it in and <laughs> and it goes, right? They would just like, you just had to wait for it to, to come out of, as it's, it's floating around in the air, right? You just had to wait for the bread to, wait long enough for the bread to rise, yeah. Um, which is why when they, when they made uh, bread for the Passover, it wasn't, they didn't have enough time to let it rise. That was the idea. It's like, no, no, we're going to get out of here so quick that we're not going to wait for this to rise. You're just going to put your flour in there, knead it, throw it on the fire, let it, let it bake. It's going to be flat. And let's go. It's time to go. Be ready to go. So the kingdom of heaven, again, I think this is another parable where it's just the kingdom of heaven grows and it grows. Now, I think there, I interpret a little bit of a time element in here. I don't know. What do you guys think? Mm -hmm. Three, three measures. Yeah, three Yeah. Yeah. I mean, with bread, it's very clear, right? Mm -hmm. you, you know, you're making bread to eat, right? But so I think I think the time element is an important element to think about. It's like, how long does it take for the kingdom of heaven to grow and to spread out over the whole world? Well, so far, 2,000 years. Long time. Long time, right? What is, yeah, what's, what's God's timetable? Is it, is it short? Or is it, like, how much patience does God have? When, when Paul writes that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance... Like, he's very, like, people call him slack. Oh, he's, he's just wasting time away, right? He's slack in keeping his promises. People might think that God is slack in keeping his promises. But should we think that, knowing that the kingdom of heaven is like leaven? No, it's long-suffering. It's long-suffering. It takes a long time. So, and this is where, like, if I was... Let's say I was going to preach these two parables because they're very similar, right? We could talk about, once I get the, the main point that, okay, we're talking about this takes a while. There's patience involved, right? We could talk about the long suffering of God. We could talk about the patience of God. Uh, we could talk about the history of Israel and how long God was patient with Israel through so many different things, just like, Come on, let's get with the program. Kingdom of priests, let's, like, let's go, come on. And he was so patient with them. Like, you could talk about patience. Now, I've, I've kind of, I've gotten the main idea, and now I'm expanding on it as a preaching point. And with a preaching point, it's like there's your idea, which is like, let's say the idea would be, the first point could be, uh, just like the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven uh, is is like leaven in that it takes a long time for the lump to to grow and expand and have a loaf of bread. So God is very patient with His people. Example, example, example of God being patient with His people, or the direct like I, that just came to mind the the quote from uh, I don't remember exactly where it's at, but where God is long suffering and He's not slack keeping His promise. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Like, that's why God is so patient, because he's so loving. And you could, you could talk about that. And it's all swirling around this idea of, of the leaven taking a long time to grow the loaf. But then, to make it applicable to your audience, you could then go, okay, how long does your personal spiritual growth take? We could probably expect it to, yeah, we could expect it to take a long time. The sanctification process is not a quick one. It's a long game. It's not a short game, right? So then the next layer of application, what about your expectations on the people around you for their spiritual growth? And then we're back in Matthew 18, right? That person sinned against me. Yes, they did. What do we do with that? Well, here are the principles, here are the steps to take, right? 
go one on one, bring some witnesses, bring it before the, like those are the steps. But when it comes to the time element, what should our expectations be for someone's spiritual growth? Like if someone, let's say someone gets caught in sin and they, it's throw, let, I'm, I'm gonna use, yeah. Let's say someone brings it up, they throw it in their face, so they're confronted with their sin, and they go, I need to change. But let's say they've had 10 years of practice in that sin. Is it reasonable to expect them to immediately change on a dime? No, it's not. Because the kingdom of heaven is like leaven. It's going to take a long time to put that sin to death. Now, should we put certain boundaries in place because we know that they've had 10 years of practice in that sin? And should we encourage them and try and help them maintain those boundaries? Yes, as they grow. But that growth is, is slow. And managing our expectations with that growth is important because the kingdom of heaven is like leaven. And it's like, boom, it's right back to the text. Like, that's, in my mind, I'm going, okay, cool, this is what, <laughs> you know, like, I'm, I'm like putting, putting these things together if I were to, to preach it. But first, it's like, what is the main idea? What's the, the, the point of the parable? Once I get that, okay, now from that main, main point, what, what do I learn, what can I know about God? And what can I know about myself? And what can I know about my relationship to others? Like theology, what can I know about God? That will inform how I behave towards myself and towards others. And so it's like I'm working through, thinking through those things. Yep. All these things spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables, and without a parable spake he not unto them. That it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. Then Jesus set, sent the multitude away and went into a house, and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the terrors uh, of the field. So now the crowds are gone, and it's just his disciples. And he's like, cool, I'm going to give you the interpretation. Because remember, all he did was tell the story. And so then it's supposed to get you thinking, oh, what, I wonder what, what that person represents. I wonder what this thing represents. You're supposed to fill in those blanks and see if the interpretation works. So he said, he answered and said unto them, he that soweth the good seed is the son of man. So it's like right here, oh, Jesus. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world and the reapers are the angels. So he gives you exactly what everything represents in the, in the parable. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. So this is definitely a not yet. <laughs> right? Because this, this is talking about the final judgment. This is talking about, all right, you have the children of the kingdom and children of the wicked one in a different kingdom. The enemy sowed that, but they grow up together until the end. And what's interesting is he assumes that the kingdom, uh, the kingdom of heaven is all encompassing. So the harvest is at the end of the world. The reapers are the angels. Um, let's see. Verse 41, the son of man shall send forth his angels and they shall gather out of his kingdom, all things that offend and them which do iniquity. So, Is the, earth the Lord, is the earth the Lord's and the fullness thereof? It's, not, <laughs> it's like, yes. Like, it all belongs to him. He's the owner of a cattle on a thousand hills, and he owns the hills too. 
Like, it's all his. It's all under his authority. So all of these things are going to grow at the same time. And I think the, the, the kingdom will spread out and conquer more. It'll be slow, but it'll conquer more and more of the earth. I think that's what those two parables about the mustard seed and the, and the loaf are getting at. There's growth. There's growth. In this one, there will be a final judgment. And we can count on that. And God's not slack in keeping his promise. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like under a treasure hidden in a field, the which, when a man hath found, he hideth, uh, he hideth, and for joy thereof, go and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. Hmm. What's that getting at? That's how precious it should be to us. Yeah. It should be. Yes. Uh, hmm. So, I guess I want to get away from the should. There's a part of me that, like, I agree. That's how we should view it. Um, because it is. It's not that's it. Yes. It is valuable. It, to us, it yeah. should be. So, but the, the, the parable illustrates someone who gets it. Oh, then it is. Right? It, okay. Yeah, it is. Okay. Exactly. Like, yep. So that... The, we should be hiding our treasures in the field in mm -hmm. heaven. We should be... So I think what he's getting at is there was in the ancient world, if you had a, you know, if you had, if you had some money, um, some people would like, it's like, cool, I want to have something to give to my children. They, they would just bury it in a field. They would just hide it. And the idea here is like someone found it and they're like, oh, like, this is like, Buried treasure, right? <laughs> it's like X marks the spot. It's kind of kind of similar here. So there's a tre there's a treasure. It's worth a lot. That's high value, right? And someone finds it. They're so stoked about it that they sell everything that they have just so they can buy the field in which it's buried, and then it's theirs. So there's there's an idea of joy because they found something that is of value. They have to understand that it's valuable. And then there's a cost, right? They sell everything that they have and buy the field. And then, then they, get, they get whatever it is that's in the field. So it's, it's uh, but what's assumed in the story is that the, the man understands the value. And so... So again, like I agree with your conclusion. It should be that should be our, our mindset. But uh, again, like if I'm thinking through, okay, I want to understand what it means and then get to an application through, like the application is kind of the final part. And you already jump into it, which is great. But it's like I want to slow down and work through, okay. Because part of the, part of the point I could I could make if I expand this out a little bit is <clears throat> is the attitude of the man that finds that finds the treasure, and in the story we see that he has the right attitude. He sees it as valuable, but then your another preaching point could be not everybody sees this as valuable. They stumble over the treasure all the time, and they never see it. Yeah, he's talking to Jesus face to face, right? It's like, whoa, people. St and, and man, now that, like this just popped in my mind. See how it strikes you. I don't, it just popped in my mind, so I don't know if it's if it's a good thought or a bad thought. We should analyze it, maybe. So, but he just talked about uh, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. He who has eyes to see, they won't see. So he's been preaching about the kingdom for three years. Some people see it. Some people don't. This man sees it in this story. And like, it's almost like, it's like he sees it and he gets it. And he's like, I need to get rid of everything else that's important to me just to get this. Everything else is not important compared to the value of this treasure. Like, that's... That's the mindset. 
But there's plenty of people that don't see it that way. They don't see Christ as anything special. Which, like, that's right, just like the rich, yeah, the rich young ruler. Just, they don't see it. So that could be a point where it's like, this man saw the value, but a lot of people don't. That could be one, maybe, point, and maybe have an illustration from either from the Bible, like the rich young ruler, or just from maybe interacting at the, uh, at the state fair, talking with people, where it's like you, you see these, you talk to these people, and you can see that they, they're understanding, but there's something else in their life that they're holding in as a higher value than the treasure that they can find in Christ, and that they can find if they enter the kingdom of God. And they're like, mm, not willing to give that up. It's like, okay, well then you're not going to have the treasure that's in the field. And it's worth giving everything else up for. And that would be like the next application, right? It's totally worth it. Why is it worth it? A, B, C. Here are the reasons why it's worth it. That was the first, <laughs> first bell. All right, and then this one I think is, is very similar. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. So again, selling everything for this one valuable thing. It's like this one thing is of such great value that everything else, by comparison, is not important. That's what the kingdom of heaven is like. That's what it's like. And when someone gets it, they're willing to make that sacrifice. They're willing to sell everything that they have to make those changes. Now, if, how, would, how would that apply to someone who's already in the kingdom? Or could it apply to someone who's already in the kingdom? Mm -hmm. Yep. Give up your earthly desire to pursue holiness and pursue. Kingdom. Yeah. So some. Yeah. This could be. Uh, so, it, yeah. And you're you're growing in your your Christ likeness. You're growing in your sanctification, right? Because the more you. So it's uh, I guess in, in fancy theological terms, it's like you have your justification and your sanctification, right? Just that you're saved. That's justification. You were made right before God because of what Christ accomplished on your behalf. There's nothing you could do to earn that. There's nothing you could do to add to that. It's like, it's already done for you. You have to receive it. That's your justification. When you stand before God, God doesn't see you in your sin. He sees Christ in his righteousness. It's glorious. Like, praise the Lord, hallelujah, can I get an amen? Like, what's going on here? That's justification. Now, for you to actually look like that takes a long time and growth and being confronted with sin and making changes and repenting of sin, right? So imagine that that pearl of great price is another truth that you weren't aware of. Every time we read our Bible, every time we hear a sermon, every, t yeah. every time. It depends on where our heart is. Again, going back to that, that, uh, the first uh, parable of the seeds and the soil, or this parable of the seed and the soils, the different soils. Going into the next one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right? So, see, they all kind of <clears throat> fit together. They're all swirling around the same ideas, right? But if that, let's say that pearl of great price, you hear this sermon and it just like, hits you in the heart and you go, man, I need to change something. Well, what are you willing to give up to make that change? It's not nece it doesn't necessarily have to be about salvation. It could totally be about your sanctification. Because day by day, you're either feeding your spirit or you're feeding your flesh. And if you want that spiritual growth, then lean into the spirit instead of into the flesh. And when you see those truths, they're just like that pearl of great price. It's super valuable. And when you see the value of it, what are you going to sell everything to get that, to get that thing? I mean, this applies to your parenting. It applies to your marriage. It applies, it applies everywhere, right? What are you willing to do 
when you see that, that pearl of great price. You have to see it as a pearl of great price. And that's kind of the point. And then your, your preaching point is, do you see this as, the, like, can you see? Do you have eyes to see? And you wave your arms and you raise your voice and it's like, come on! Yeah, like that. <laughs> Something like that. All right, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, keep, uh, we'll keep working through that. Uh, but 